all welcome to today's event being hosted by the Association of Nigerian Scholars in America, ANSA. And today we'll be looking at breaking down the US F1 visa interview for Nigerian students. We know that a lot of you have gotten your admission decisions and you've accepted schools that you want to go to. So the next thing you'll be working on now is how to get your US F1 visa. And we are hoping that today's um, webinar will really help you guys prepare and get approvals when you go for your interview. So um, my name is Jane Aguara and I will be one of the panelists for today's event. And with me, I also have some other panelists. We have um, Damilola Akamo. Damilola will be part of the panelists. We have Sebastian Nobuka, and we also have the president of the Association of Nigerian Scholars in America, Ayodeji Israel, who will be with us, who will be speaking to us in a few minutes. So in this webinar, we'll be covering different sections. First of all, we'll um, look at what is ANSA. I know some of you, this might be your first time attending an event hosted by ANSA. So we'll be looking at what is ANSA and the programs involved in ANSA before we will go into the visa um, interview discussion proper. And why the um, discussions are going on, if you have any question, there'll be time for question and answers, but if you have any question as the discussion is going on, please make use of the chat box, type in your questions there. And when it's time for question and answer, we will address them. So at this point, I would like to welcome the president, Israel Ayodeji to take over. Ayo, are you there? Hello? No, I think you can't unmute. I don't know why. Can you unmute? Oh, okay, yes, it's my fault. Give me a minute. Oh, yeah. My fault. Um, I, you should be good now. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Demi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ayodeji. I welcome everyone to our info session. We're glad to have everyone here. Um, just brief about ANSA. Uh, the acronym ANSA stands for Association of Nigerian Scholars in America. Uh, I know some of us are aware of this already. You see that on our banner, on our flyers everywhere. Um, so ANSA was born out of the passion to give back to the community, basically. Everyone, uh, most of the ANSA board members, everybody have gone through these processes application process, transitioning process to abroad and uh, studying the graduate school studies and everything. I will believe we have the resources. We understand the struggles faced by international students, you know, both during this school application process and transitioning abroad. We believe we have the resources in place um, to see to some of the burdens that we believe are common to international students. And we are here to help, you know, pivot through some of those challenges and make the application process easier uh, and the transition in smoother. So basically in summary, we support uh, prospective students, which are students who are in the application process currently, uh, looking to study in the United States of America in their different respective fields. Uh, we support in different, you know, various capacities uh, who, who provide information sessions, just like the one we are in now for visa. Uh, uh, questions that you have and letting you know what you need to do and what you should not do so you can secure your visa. Um, we have resources, different resources on our website. If you go to answerofficial.com, you see resources like standardized test materials. Um, what you, should, you need to take a look at this, uh, take a look at the website and see some of these resources. They are gonna help you. They're there for you to succeed. Uh, in your application process, for sure. Um, we also want to touch on scholarships and fellowship. I believe uh, some of our awardees are on this call, if, if not all of them. Um, we have uh, given awarded scholarship and fellowship uh, in the past to students who are either applying to schools abroad in terms of uh, fees to pay for their uh, standardized test and even application fees to schools. Um, if you want more information on that as well, you should go on our website for that. Um, we also offer 
mentorship program. So this is where you get connected to life mentors. Um, they answer questions regarding um, application process, whatever you want to know, um, whatever challenges you have. You have somebody life that you can talk to and they are always ready to help. Um, so just to touch briefly that we have resources to support current students as well. Current students are uh, students who are already in the United States of America studying. Uh, we believe we want to offer a community uh, that will embrace everybody, you know, in terms of need, in terms of support, in terms of relapse, in terms of burning out a community you can come to and uh, you get support. So for the current students, we, we offer a series of social and academic activities. Um, we offer game series where you can just come in and play games with other members of the community or the association. You have fun, you feel good before you go back to your studies. Um, also, we are kickstarting very soon a professional mentorship program uh, where we were trying to connect students with industry experts and professionals. Uh, we believe one thing uh, to get in uh, jobs or internship offer easily is to actually have recommendations. So we have strong link with the industry professionals and we're thinking this can be uh, an image avenue to support our current students as well uh, by offering them referrals or recommendations when they're doing their internship or job search uh, process. Um, so I wouldn't want to talk much because I know we have a lot of things to talk about. We have questions that uh, that needs to be answered. But I would like to implore us to, to, to join this amazing community. Just go on our website, answerofficial.com, uh, look at the different membership categories and just uh, join the one you're interested in. All right, thank you very much and enjoy the session. Thank you so much, Aya, for that introduction and info. So guys, we also have different special interest groups that when you become a member, you can join one, um, one of these groups. Please go to the website, explore the website, become a member, and we would love to have you with us. So we'll go into um, the webinar proper, and we will start by talking about the visa application process. And I would like to welcome one of our board members and panelists, Dami Lola Kama, to take over. Yeah, thank you, Jane, for the uh, for the great work, and thank you, Ay, for uh, talking about answer. I want to welcome everyone uh, once again to this event uh, where we will talk about uh, the visa U.S. Uh, F1 visa application process uh, proper proper. Um, uh, this is just uh, like a flow, uh, a process flow, uh, telling us what the whole process entails first. You know, before you can even talk about getting a, a US visa, you need to get admitted into one of the accredited uh, universities here in the United States. Um, after you get admitted, uh, the next step would be to uh, be in contact with your school. I mean, the school that gave you admission where you um, obtain what we call the certificate of eligibility for F1 uh, visa, which is what we call the form I-120. So the form I-120 is actually what certifies, uh, certifies you to come into the US uh, on F1 uh, visa. When you uh, get that from the university, uh, the next step would be that you need to pay uh, the service fee, which is the uh, you need to create this, uh, you need to pay the service. I mean, you, you have to first generate the Form I-901 uh, service uh, coupon using the information uh, on the I-20. I think you, you need the, the service number, the service ID on the I-20 to generate that. When you generate that, you pay the service fee. Uh, after payment of the service fee, then the next step would be to go on for uh, the visa application process. So the visa application process involves you filling in your information in the DS1, uh, form DX160. Uh, that's where you fill all your uh, personal information, uh, your family information, the various schools you've attended, you know, right from your high school to college. And then uh, the reason why you're traveling, who is funding your travel, which university are you going to, you know, you, you have to fill all that. I want to say that it's very important to be to be honest, you know, when you when you're filling all those things and make sure that your information tallies across board, right? 
uh, after you fill the necessary forms, you also pay uh, for the visa fee. I think you pay $160 for uh, the US uh, visa application. Uh, when you pay that, you know, the next step will be to schedule an appointment. When you schedule the appointment, you have to appear at the embassy. Uh, when you appear at the embassy, basically you are meeting the visa officer to uh, to, uh, to to actually show that you are eligible to school in the United States. Uh, basically, they are going to ask you a series of questions. They are going to test you to know that truly you are actually going to the United States or if you merited uh, the, the US visa. And uh, it's based on the discretion of the visa officer to approve or to deny the US visa based on the information you've provided and your responses to the questions, you know. So uh, it's always advisable that you give a reasonable response and uh, be coherent in your conversation with the visa officer. I always tell people you have three, three minutes, maximum four minutes to determine your fate. Either you get uh, the US visa or not. So you want to make sure that you are at your best, you are giving the right response, you are uh, just uh, at your best. You are bringing in the hay game to the embassy. Then uh, they give you the visa approval. Uh, once you are approved, uh, I think they, they take your passport for a few days and then they stamp it with the US visa, US F1 visa, and uh, you are free to come to the United States. So that is uh, the basic uh, process. And I believe that most people on this call have either gotten their admission or they are still waiting for the admission. Now, let's say you've gotten your admission and uh, you've discussed with your school, they've sent you the I, uh, I-20. I know they do that very fast. You know, There's no issue once you are admitted. Uh, once they issue your I-20, you want to make sure that you pay the service fee uh, and then you also pay for the visa application. So after paying for the visa application, right, we then talk about uh, booking the appointment, if you have booked the appointment. So what is the next thing? Appearing at the embassy. And I think that's the reason why most people join uh, the call today. So what do we do at the embassy? And what are the things that we should uh, pay attention to? So we'll be discussing that next. Uh, Jane, can you move to the next slide? So moving on to the next slide, uh, we wanna talk about all the necessary documents, you know, that you need at the embassy, I mean, a lot of people say also, what, what are the documents that I need to take along with me to the embassy, right? One major document that you can't even joke with is your passport, your international passport. It has to be a valid passport. When we are talking about the valid passport, we are saying that it must be valid for at least six months beyond your you know, stay in the United States. Say for instance, you are coming to the US in, uh, in June, for instance, and you are appearing at the embassy now, and your, your passport is expiring in May, then it's not really a valid one because it has to be you know, uh, valid for at least six months, uh, a six month period of your stay in the United States. So you want to make sure uh, that is uh, catered for. Then number two, you also need the form uh, DS-160 confirmation page. Uh, then uh, the third thing is that you must also show your visa application fee uh, receipt and then your service fee payment receipt. You know, you want to take that along with you. They are very uh, crucial document that you don't want to uh, leave out. Then one, one important one too is your for my 120. You know, you, you, they are going to ask that, you know, immediately you come to the embassy and then the visa officer is about interrogating you. They ask for your passport. They also ask for your for my 120. They check your for my 120 to be sure that, you know, you are a valid, uh, uh, a valid uh, student, truly, as you as you claim. So you want to make sure that you are with that. You know, it it must be signed. It must be assigned uh, for my one twenty by the school and by you too. So that is crucial. And you also want to take with you the letter of admission or your funding offer, as the case may be. Don't leave that out. Then uh, uh, I think uh, the passport photograph too. The U.S. There, there is a requirement. You know, you can check that on the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, visa website so you 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 have to go with the right requirement of the passport i mean the passport size now then another set of document that you want to take along with you is the uh 
your academic uh, certificates, your diplomas, you know, your transcripts, you know, they can ask and they might not ask. It's dependent on how your visa interview uh, goes or it's dependent on the visa officer. You know, the visa officer might be the one that wants to really scrutinize everything. So you must be sure that, you know, you are with those uh, set of documents, your transcript, your set, uh, degree certificate, as the case may be, and then uh, the set of uh, standardized test uh, results, like the GRE, the TOEFL, and the SAT, for those that are coming for undergrad. So those are all uh, required uh, documents. Then another one is uh, another one is actually the the financial statements. You know, for those that uh, do not have uh, full funding, uh, so it is it is important that you. Jane, I can see the, the, the screen again. So for those that don't have, uh, for those that don't have uh, no, the fund, okay, for, for those that don't have funding yet, right? You know, you need to show truly that you have the financial standing to school in the United States. I mean, you have the financial stability to cater for all your needs in the United States. So uh, the visa officer will also want to scrutinize that. They want to check, okay, you have a deficit. How are you going to uh, care for that? What is the proof? You need to show your financial statement, at least three to six months uh, of recent uh, uh, document. So that is very important to take along uh, with you to the embassy. So if you have a full funding, I, I don't think that should, uh, I don't think that should be an issue. You know, once you have full funding, you can only see that on your I-120. It means that you don't need a personal fund. So uh, that is settled. But if you if you are self-funding yourself, I mean, if you are sponsoring yourself, then you want to make sure that you go to the embassy with the financial statement uh, that is recent and it's, uh, you know, uh, it's valid. If, as I always say, please don't go to the embassy with fake documents. Don't go to the embassy with fake documents. I know how people can try to play smart you know, and uh, they just want to maneuver their way. No, don't do that. Don't do that. It's very important that all the documents that you are providing are valid and they are, uh, you know, they are the required uh, set of documents. I, I've had cases of people that got admitted, they got the I-120, uh, the I-20, and then they, you know, they they didn't really get funding, right? They were able to tender a financial statement to the school uh, before the school issued them the I-20, right? But when they were going to the embassy, they thought the fact that, oh, because I've submitted a financial statement to the school, I don't need to take another, I don't need to take another, uh, I don't even you know, take the statement to, to the embassy. But then the visa officer is going to ask because the visa officer wants to know how you are going to fund yourself. So if you don't take uh, the financial statement with you to the embassy on that day, for sure, the visa officer is going to deny you. Most likely, the visa officer is going to deny you. So you want to make sure that you avoid all that. You know, you have gone through the stress of applying to schools, you know, uh, facing various uh, review process with admission committee, uh, you've gotten uh, your admission, uh, you've applied for visa, and then just one mistake of not taking a document with you can just, uh, you know, terminate the whole process. So you want to make sure that you take all the required documents. So these are the, uh, you know, most of uh, the most important documents that you need to take to the embassy. Um, if you want to take more, that is fine. That is beneficial, just in case, you know. But I think these are the set of documents that really uh, uh, show that truly you, uh, you, you, uh, you need for the embassy. And then some people will say, "Oh, possibly I, I, I'm granted. I have a, an appointment." Say, for instance, uh, I finished the post class from Unilag or Bafimao Law University, and then. Uh, they said, oh, we are gonna give you an appointment. Most schools we say, like I, I know maybe you need lag or futa. They say, okay, if you finish your first class, you have uh, an automatic appointment for graduate, you know, assistant position in the school. Maybe you are gonna serve as an assistant lecturer, you know. Uh, and then you are telling them at the embassy that yes, 
I have this appointment. I'm going for maybe a master's or a PhD in the US to get more degrees so that I can come back and I can come back and then you know continue teaching. So for, for you to say that, it means that you have a proof of that appointment, say maybe an appointment letter. You don't want to say that to the VO and then you don't have any document to back up your proof because the VO can ask you, okay, you said you are giving appointment. So what is the proof of the appointment? If you cannot provide the documents to, you know, to stake your claim, then hmm, it's most likely going to be a denier. As I always say, you have three to five minutes, you know, with the VO to determine your fate. So you want to make sure that you are putting in the right, you know, statements. You are with the right documents, and everything should uh, should sync for you to get your visa uh, approved. So I think those are the important documents. If you have more. It's good, take them along, but just make sure that everything you are saying, you have documents to back them up and make sure that your documents are valid. Please don't take a fake document or invalid document to the embassy. You know, you might, you might, you might be banned, you know. So you don't want to, you don't want to have that kind of stain on your record. Yeah. I think that's that's uh what we have for the document checklist. Okay, um, thank you so much, Dami, for that. So the next thing we'll be looking at today is the interview preparation tips. Now you've gotten the admission, you've gotten um, your I-20, you've paid for your visa, you've fixed the date for your visa interview. The next project to cross is how to prepare for the visa. So you don't want to go through all the process. And then when it comes to um, the interview date, it's like you're not sure of what you're doing. So the one of the most important aspects aside making sure you have all your documents is the question and answer. That is what you go to the um, embassy to do on your interview date. The question and answer, you have to be fully prepared for this. We'll be talking, at, we're looking into this um, in more details in the next slide. But the next thing I want to talk about is the mock interview. So some people, they just be like, okay, I'm the one that got the admission. So whatever they ask me, I'll be able to answer. And they go there with that um, having a mock interview before going. Just like Dami said, you have three to five minutes to get that um, visa approved or not. So it's better you prepare ahead of time before going there. Make sure you practice the questions. Some people will look at the question and be like, oh, they are simple questions. If they ask me, I'll be able to answer. But you realize that you will get there because of tension. Simple questions that will actually you start stammering or you start rambling and start saying things you're not supposed to say. But if, you're, if you have a mock interview, you're already prepared, you already know the answers to your question. So once they ask you, you just start talking. It shows you are confident and it shows that you know what you're doing. So you don't want to go there, they ask you a question that at, at the spot you start thinking of the answer to give them. So that's why it's always advisable that you do mock interviews before you're going for your main interview. The next one is to have all your documents, just like Daniel also said. The, the documents we have listed in the previous slide is not is those are the main documents that you need, but you can always go with more. It's better you go there with SS documents than you get there and there's a particular document you need and you don't have it. There's there's not going to be an opportunity like okay, let me go outside and bring it and come inside. Once your slot, you miss your slot. That is the end of the interview for you. You have to apply again. So you make sure you are fully prepared before going there. Then the next point is for you to be mentally prepared. So I've spoken to a lot of students who go for their visa interview. And one of the problems they face is that before going for the interview, you've already conditioned your mind that they don't used to give people visa. I might not get the visa. You have to be mentally prepared that, okay, I've gotten this admission. I want to go to the US to study. So I should be able to go through the interview process. If you mentally prepare yourself for it, you realize that there is nothing difficult about the interview. And then you need to be confident and you need to be calm. Confidence because I have seen people that got fully funded scholarships from their school, but they still get denied when they go for the interview. Now the document is showing that they are fully funded with stipend, they don't need anything, but still they get denied. Why? Because they were not confident when they were answering their questions. So the visa officers will look at you and sometimes from your countenance, they will decide to deny you the visa. Not that there's anything that you've done wrong, but because of the way you are acting, it gives them the impression that I'm not sure this one is going to that place to study. This one is probably looking for a way to run out of the country and move to the US. So you want to be very confident with your answers and be calm. Now let's talk about the dressing. I said here, we said here dress appropriately. Dress appropriately means 
dress in a way that you are comfortable. Comfortable, I'm not saying for guys, don't go, you can wear tie and suit if you want to, but it's not necessary. It's not, it's not like it's mandatory, you have to do that. Whatever makes you feel comfortable, what you feel like if you're going for a, a corporate interview, you will dress like, please dress that way. Don't, some people have this mentality of, I'm going to the US, the US is a place where you show fashion, so let me show them that I'm ready to blend in. And then they will dress all gagged up with their stuff. Trust me, you give them the wrong impression about you. So if you know, however, as a lady, as a guy, however you would dress, if you're going for a corporate interview or whatever, please, dress that way and make sure you are comfortable and then arrive early there are usually a lot of people at the embassy i remember i did my visa interview in abuja i know what the queue was like so you want to make sure you are there on time not that you have a 10 a.m interview and you're getting there by 9 30 or, or 9 45 saying you still have 15 minutes you'll be shocked that you don't have enough time so if possible two hours or whatever works for you one hour whatever works for you make sure you are there very very early so you don't miss your slot. Then lastly is for you to practice. I said here, practice, practice, and practice. Keep practicing, keep practicing. The more you practice, the more confident you get and the more relaxed you will get about answering those questions. So that when you get there and they start answering you the questions, asking you the questions, you'll be very comfortable and very confident to answer them. So let's go into the type of questions you would get, which is usually the question that students have, okay, what are the questions I should be expecting? Now, there are different questions that you can get, but it means that they're not going to ask you all of those questions. They just pick whatever and ask you. Some people will go for the interview, they'll get just one question. Some will get two, some will get five. It depends on what the visa interview is feeling like or how the visa um, officer is feeling like that day. That determines what, how many questions they will ask you and also how the conversation is going. So we've categorized the questions that you will get into five categories, being your study plans, the, your university choice, your academic capability, your financial status, and your post-graduation plans. So the questions they are going to be asking you will all come from these five categories. And we'll be looking at them in more details as we, as we go on. So let's see. Um, the first question being questions related to your study plan. There are different questions they can ask you, which we have listed here. I will not be answering all of them. I'll not be talking about all of them, but you can take note of them or even take a screenshot if you want to. But the tip I want to give you guys about answering this question is, do not give a one response answer. So for instance, number one says, why are you going to the US? First of all, your document shows that you are applying, that you applied for an F1 student visa. So it's obvious you're going to the US to study, but the visa officer can still ask you, why are you going to the US? And the answer you should give is not, I'm going to do my master's. I'm going to do my undergraduate. I'm going to do my PhD. You have to give them more context to your answer. Don't just give a one response answer make sure you have more context to what um, the answer you're giving them. For instance, if they ask you, um, let me see, let me pick a question here. Um, why are you planning to continue your education? In this case, for you to answer this, you can talk about your future goal. Maybe start by talking about your previous um, start, um, degree that you have, or maybe the occupation you were doing and how the degree you're going to get is going to help you further your um, career or whatever, just like um, when Dami was talking, let's assume you are already a lecturer in Nigeria, so you need to get a PhD for you to get promotion or whatever. In this case, you go into more details, telling them, okay, this is why I need this degree, and I'm going to the US because it is a, a, um, a better place for studying this. Just make sure you're giving them more context to your answer. The more you talk, the more you give um, context, it shows them, okay, this one is really serious, and they actually have the intention of going to the US to study. So you, the point is that you're trying to show them that you're reason for going to the U.S. is going there to study, not because you want to leave your country. Because once you start answering and they get the impression that you're just looking for a means to leave Nigeria, then trust me, they're going to deny you the visa. So the point is for you to give more context to your answer. The next category of question is questions related to your university choice. Now, the mistake a lot of people make here is that some people do not apply for their admission by themselves. They go to agents and the agents 
people help them to apply and to get the admission. And they don't even know much about the school, um, the school they apply to. And when you get there, they ask you questions, you see them, they don't have answers to give because they don't, even if an agent applied for you or you did it yourself. I think it is still necessary that you sit down and do your research about the school that you've gotten admission, about the school that you want to go to. Do whatever research that you have to do so you'll be able to answer the question. For instance, if they ask you, how many schools rejected you? I want to state that it's normal for you to be rejected by school. So please don't go there and lie. <laughs> a lot of people feel like they need to lie to present themselves in a certain manner. Please be truthful. Being rejected when you apply to school is normal. That's why people are always advised to apply to more than one school so that if others reject you, at least you get one that will accept you. So make sure you are truthful when you're answering the questions. And also the question of, do you know um, professors at the university and what are their names. Especially if you're someone who's going to do a master's or you're going to do a research um, PhD, you know, you're going to do PhD or a research master's, please make sure you know the names of the professors in the school. Even if you're an undergraduate, you say you're going to do computer science, a university of, let's say, UT um, Austin, make sure you know the name of the professors in your school. And it's very easy to know these things. Just go to the school website, look them up so that when, when they ask you this question, you just be talking like someone that will be like, I've already been to the school before. It shows them that you're really into this thing and you really know what you're going to do. So please make sure you do your research, know about the school, know about the professors, know about the city. I'm going to talk about the city because it's important and it's something that a lot of people overlook. I have a friend who is currently studying in New York, in New York City. And when he went for his interview, the visa officer did not ask him questions about any other thing. They only discussed about New York City because the visa officer schooled in New York City. So immediately they, they looked at his documents and realized he schooled in New York City. The visa officer said just about New York City. And if he didn't do his research and he didn't have anything to say about New York City, he might have gotten a denial. So they spent the visa interview time discussing about New York City and he got an approval. So it is very important you do your research about where you're going to. So now let's talk about um, questions related to academic capability. Please also make sure you come prepared for this question. They can ask you about your test scores. And that's why it's advisable that you go with, if you go with your GRE or GMAT, if you did those uh, standardized tests, go with the printout. But if you did not do any of these tests, it's okay. You don't have to bother yourself. But if you did go with the printer, just in case, they might not ask for it, but just in case, like we, I said earlier, having more documents is better than having less. They can ask a question like, why do you want to pursue a degree in the US? I mean, you are from Nigeria. There are universities in Nigeria. Why don't you study this program in Nigeria? This is a common question that you can get. In this kind of situation, you want to use the opportunity. You can't give an answer like, because I like US or because my father wants me to study in the US or because my brother's school in the US. No, you want to use the opportunity to shower, uh, call it shower praises on the US academic system. Talk about the, the kind of um, programs they have. Talk about the quality of the professors. Talk about the quality of the research. If you are someone that plays um, um, sport, talk about this kind of sport. The, the, um, just make sure you say good things about US that makes it better for you to do that program in the US than doing it in Nigeria. Please make sure you're giving them contest, contest, contest. When I say contest, I don't mean go and start telling long stories. You can give contest in a very, in two to three sentences. Just make sure you're giving more contest to your answers. And then the next category of question, uh, question is that um, questions related to post-graduation plan. So they're going to ask you questions. They want to know, okay, is this person looking for a means to go to the US or does this person have a goal why they actually want to get this degree? So they can ask you questions like, what are your plans post-graduation? And this is a point where I would like to say that it is very good that whatever response that you're giving to them, that you tie this response back to Nigeria. Because if you are giving these answers and the sense that you do not have any tie to Nigeria, that you not plan to come, you don't, you don't have any plans of coming back to Nigeria, then you are going to be denied. Their goal is to, they like um, Nigerians, they like international students coming to the US to study, but they don't want you to study and remain in the US. They want you to get a degree and go back to where you came from. So when you're answering these questions, give, make sure your answers are tied back to Nigeria. They can ask you, um, for instance, what are your plans post-graduation? 
you'll be like, okay, I like one company there in the US. So after my studies, I want to stay and work for that company. Trust me, you're getting automatic deny. Even if that is the plan that you have, please look for that company in Nigeria and tell them how you're connected to it and why you want to come back and work in that company. Maybe your father has one business, he wants you to take over. So you need to get an MBA for you to come and take over that business. Or maybe even if your father does not have any business, there's something about Nigeria that you want to improve. So if you go get a degree in computer science in the US, it will help you come back to Nigeria and improve the um, computer science sector of Nigeria. Just whatever answer, you're going to study agriculture engineering, there's one machine, whatever that is not in Nigeria, the, the degree and the um, knowledge you gain from studying the US will help you implement it in Nigeria. So whatever response you're giving, please, the goal is tie it back to Nigeria. Because when most people get denied visa, it's always because there was no tie to their home country. Make sure your answers are tied back to Nigeria. For instance, they can ask you, are you sure you won't stay in the US after your studies? And you go there and you start smiling <laughs> because it's already obvious that is what you plan to do. Please be very bold and very confident when you're telling them, this is why I want to go get this degree. This is how I want to apply it to Nigeria. And this is my goal in Nigeria after my studies, no matter what the degree is. That I've gotten a question where somebody said their plan is to do an undergraduate degree in, in the US. And then after that, they also do a master's in the US and then a PhD. If you tell the visa officer that since you think that this one is planned to stay in the US for like 15 years and not planning to come back, please, for the time being, tie it back to Nigeria, even if that is your future goal. Just find a way to type down to Nigeria. Yeah, I think um, that is about it for the questions. We'll, we'll have time for questions and answers, and we'll also answer some of the questions that you guys have. Please keep putting them in the chat box, and we'll respond to them. Now we'll talk about the emergency visa application. Uh, thank you so much, Jane, for that elaborate uh, section. Uh, moving to the emergency visa application, now, uh, the U.S. Uh, permits one to, you know, uh, requ request to apply for expedited uh, visa in case there is any maybe unexpected uh, reason or unexpected circumstances that warrants you to quickly apply for an expedited visa. Uh, there are various things uh, for one to qualify in various visa category. It might be that maybe you are going to the U.S. for a medical issue or maybe you are going for a family funeral or one of the family member is sick or you are going for an urgent uh, business uh, trip, right? That's for various uh, visa category. But when it comes to the F1 uh, visa category, one major reason why your F1 uh, visa can be expedited might be that you got admission uh, very late and uh, your start date you know, it's very like it's, it's close by already and you are not able to get uh, a visa appointment, you know, before your start date or the visa appointment date you got is actually after the start date. In that case, you can apply for uh, an expedited uh, 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 visa if and only if uh, your, I mean, the your, your time of appointment, I mean, the, the time you are applying, so your start date is within 60 days. I mean, two, just, just two, uh, two months, right? If it's within two months, yes, you can try to apply. I know of folks that got admitted, I think less than a month to, you know, to the start date and they were able to get uh, expedited uh, uh, visa approved, right? So how do we go about this? First thing, you still have to go through the normal process, which is filling the complete DS-160 form pay the visa application fee. Then three, you have to schedule an appointment online. You have to pick the earliest available date online. You have to do that, that's very important. After you do that, you see an option where you can complete the expedited request form. So you can uh, fill that form or you can also request uh, an assistant from the call center to do that. But as I said, you must make sure that your, uh, your start date and the, uh, your day of application is within 60 days. I mean, it's, you should be very close to actually get qualified for that. Then after you fill that form, you need to wait for uh, the response from the, uh, from the embassy. The response is gonna come via email in which they tell you, oh, you've been approved or the request has been denied. So if, you, if, if they approve you, uh, then you need to go online and then 
uh, schedule an expedited appointment. When you schedule the expedited appointment, then you visit the embassy on that particular day with the appointment, uh, the appointment letter alongside all the uh, relevant documents. And that's basically uh, what it takes to uh, do the expedited uh, visa application. Yep. So. Okay, um, thank you all so much for listening. We try to um, wrap that up quickly so that we'll have time to attend to your questions. So I'm going to be reading out the question from the chat box and please the um, panelists, you can answer at any point. Okay, let's um, start. Okay, someone said, as regarding my DS-160, I finished in 2014. I started working as a January 2017 till now as an intelligent analyst. I did not include my NYC program on my DS-160 and I'm not ready to talk about it. Good. For me, I think if you say you have a gap between 2014 and 2017, you must be ready to talk about it. You, you can't you you can't shy away from it. Like the, the visa officer might ask you, like what 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 were you doing between 2014 and 2017? Were you just lying jobless or were you just you need to know what to uh, say about it. And the fact that you say you're not going to put in the NYC uh, information there, that's one year already. So what were you doing within those one year? So those gaps, you know, might might be a turn off for me as a person, if I'm the visa officer, you know, you should be able to account for all the years, you know, it, it, uh, it doesn't show a good uh, professional standing when you have so much gap and uh, like three to four years in your in your resume. So it, it's not really a good thing to do. You know, some people, you know, why they were doing the NYC, maybe they they were teaching, you know, they put it there. Some people were just doing tutor, like, okay, maybe uh, they were going about doing freelancing, you know, maybe copywriting, something like that. So you should put it there, like find a way to craft it, you know, professionally yeah. and make sure that there's no gap. You know, you don't want to give anybody uh, reason to doubt your professional history. So I think that's yeah. very important to, to fill in. Yeah, thank you. So th thank you so much, Dami. I, I think personally, I had a gap after graduation to NYC, which was like four months or five months, the usual waiting for NYC. And I know I've submitted my CV for something where they sent me an email telling me to fill up that four to five months gap, which I thought was crazy. I was like, I was not doing anything. I was at home <laughs> preparing for NYC, but I had to look for something, a way to craft it that, okay, it, this is what I was doing at that time. I was just waiting for stuff. So it's good that if you have a gap, please try to fill it in. And we are not saying you should lie. Please do not like it's okay. Like I remember my boss told me that, that people can take one year um, vacation from their job just to travel and get themselves together. That it's still okay to have something like that included. It doesn't make you here's the US. Nobody's going to judge you for that. So please fill up your gap. So the next person said, please, what should someone with 51% funding feel in who is sponsoring your trip section? When you're filling the GS160, who is sponsoring your trip? Uh, for me, I, I would like to play safe in that in that in that sense. Even if I'm the one funding my trip, I would like to put maybe one of my close relatives, maybe my father or my mother, or the person that you know is actually funding my. Because if you are going to the embassy with 51% funding, somebody must be ready to fund that 49%. So I can put that person as the one funding the 49%, you know, to show that yes, this person is truly ready to support. Uh, to support my education and uh, we talked about it you know we've uh, fleshed it out and you must already talk about it at the at the embassy that might even be the major highlight of your of your interview they, they, will, they will surely ask so think about you know convincing responses to give okay uh, so i think probably the person also wants to know if it is the school that is fun that is 
they are going to put as their sponsor or themselves since they have it one percent. So it's with the one percent, the school is not fully funding you. So somebody is still going to fund you. So pl- please put that person as your sponsor. And then talking about just to buttress what Dami just said, when you're talking about who is sponsoring you, please make sure you have a valid, a reasonable reason as to why and because as to why they are funding you. Sometimes some people their sponsor is not going to be their dad or their mom. It's going to be an auntie and or an uncle. So you want to make sure you have a reason why that uncle is sponsoring because uncles don't just go around sending people to the US. So why are they willing to spend so much amount of money on you? Please make sure you have a reasonable reason why they're sponsoring you. The next question we're going to look at is, hello, how best do you answer the question? Person, entity, paying your trip. Okay, I think if you have awarded a fully funded scholarship, I have people tell me different things. Yeah, I think uh, during my time, I was awarded a fully funded scholarship and I had the money to fund my trip. I said I was the one funding my trip by myself because um, I, I don't really think that will matter so much if you are fully funded, right? Your yeah. parents can also fund you. You can put self if you have the money or you put your parents as, as your funder. So it, it doesn't really change anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So how best do you ask? Okay, I think you sent the question to us. Can I go for a visa interview now for fall 2020 resumption? Now. Um, now, I think the the, okay. the the law says that you must be able to uh, apply for the US visa uh, 120 days to your start date, right? That's like four months four months to your start date, if we have to look at it. So if you are resuming, say, uh, in August, say August 1, right? And we are already ending uh, April, we are going to May. So we have May, June, July. So you are good to go to apply for visa interview. I think, that means if I'm not mistaken, right? I think you can come into the US at least, at most 30 days within when you're supposed to start school. So you can't, if, you're, if your I-26 is supposed to start school in August, you can't come into the U.S. now. No, no, you can't come. You can't, it's, I think the question is apply. Like, you can apply. Yes, so you can apply. Even if they grant it, you can't come in now. It, it has to be at least 30, at least 30 days. days before your school resumes. So you're not coming to jail for five months before yeah. you, you start. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so please, I still need the document checklist page. Okay, we are going to upload this recorded video or webinar on our YouTube and other social media platforms. Please make sure to follow us on our social media platforms, Association of Nigerian Scholars in America. Also check us out on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram. We are all over there. You will see um, this video uploaded and you can check the document checklist. Thank you. And also make sure to follow us and subscribe to our channels. <laughs> the next question says, does an F2 need to fill a separate form on CGI website if he or she is going for interview on the same day with the F1? I'm thinking that the F2 visa, right, is, is a different form of visa from the F1, right? So I, I'm guessing, I'm not so sure about it, but I'm, I'm guessing that you, you have to fill in everything, like it's a separate form of application. So you need to do it separately. It's, it's yeah. very important. Right. Go to the um, visa website and you see the um, whatever the how to fill in how to apply for F two visa. Yeah. For those that are now aware, F two visa is a dependent visa. So if you got an admission to study in the US, you can come in with your husband, your wife, your kids on that, and they will come in on that F two visa. So how many times can one be scheduled for the interview? Please, okay, I think it's two different questions. How, how many times can one reschedule? So reschedule in the I think, okay. I, yeah, I think you can only reschedule twice. You, you are permitted to reschedule your visa uh, appointments twice. After that, you you can reschedule again. So okay. you only permitted to reschedule twice. All right. So the next one we're looking at is, please, I have a bank statement from September to February 2022. Is it still valid? Because that's what I use to process the admission or do I need to get another one? September to February. February. That's like... Um, so the... <laughs> that's the last, almost... You're already in 2023, right? No, 2022. 
<laughs> we are in it to dummy. Don't fly. Oh, oh, sorry. Maybe I'm already flying. <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh, if you if you be up uh, if you going to the embassy, see some somewhere around uh May, uh, uh that's already three months behind, right? Yeah, you need a new one. So I, I think I think it would be safe if you can get uh you know a recent a recent one. Yeah. A recent one. Please get a recent one. February is like how many months ago? Please get a recent one. Yeah, uh, February is like two months ago. Just to chime in, if if you can't get a risk, I know application process for passport um, is not a smooth process. In Nigeria currently, it takes time. So mm -hmm. if you have like your application, uh, the evidence that you've applied, you can take that to the embassy as well with your current. No, you're not talking about bank statements. Bank okay, statements. Bank. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, know. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, I saw a question on passport. I guess oh. I was going to attempt in on that. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. the person is asking the passport is expiring soon. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a need to get like apply for a new one? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I think there is need to apply for a new one as backup. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't come out before your interview, you just take all the evidence that you have that you've applied mm -hmm. and uh, take it to the embassy with you. Yeah, that's a good response. Um, okay. Moving on, it says, one person says, Early, earliest appointment data fund is January 2023, but I intend to request for emergency appointment in June. That is 60 days to resumption. However, my passport expires January 2023. That's completely fine. June is yeah. still, January is still like seven months ahead. So like we said earlier, if you are here doing the document checklist, your passport should be at least six months before expiration when you go for your interview. So yeah, it's, it's, it's still fine. If you want to renew, even in when you want to renew your passport, they also say you should renew before like six months. So I think you are fine to go with it, but if you want to renew, that's still okay, but it's fine. So the next question is you should, okay, yeah, someone is responding to that. You can see, yeah, you can see apply just for a backup. So you don't even come to the US and start struggling to renew it, but it's still okay to use that. So someone asks, if asked how many schools you applied, please, is it right to mention two in the US, two in the UK, or just mention the US once you apply? They don't care about UK, am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think majorly they are gonna focus on the US schools. Yeah, they have no business with what you apply to. Just mention, please mention the US two schools you applied to in the US. I hope that is, answers your question. Please, can you display the previous slide on questions related to the study plan? Okay, I can do that. Okay, yeah, you can look at that. So next question I have is, um, can we, you guys should help me check time. How much time do we have? Okay, we still have time. Can we add us to strike um, as reason for leaving Nigeria to study? <laughs> that's that's a very funny one. I don't think you want to do that. No, you don't want to do that. That's not that's not a sound response uh, to me at best. It's not even convincing. So yeah, you want to actually state how studying in the US, you know, helps you as a person. I mean, your career growth, uh, you being exposed to the work class facility and you know, uh, professionals in the in the field, how it's going to help your own career, how it's going to make you a better person, how it's going to help you solve problems. You want to acquire skills to solve problems. I think that's that should be the narrative. You don't want to talk about that, so strike. I know the person's concern might also be the fact that probably they've already they've already started <clears throat> they already started the program. So now they, they like might ask them, okay, you already started like two years or three years in Nigeria, and now you want to leave. You can tell them something like, okay, you've gone for like a year, two years in Nigeria, you've seen how the education system is, and you know how better it is in the US. You give the reasons why the US is better. So you feel you mm -hmm. better for finish up in the US. Please give yeah. the reasons why the US is better based on the yeah. That you've already gathered within your one, two, three years in schools in Nigeria. Because, because yes, I'm, I know people that actually I know someone that Asu Strike made him <laughs> when I was in school in Nigeria. <laughs> Asu Strike made him leave before we came back fast. My guy was in the US. Anyways, let's, let's move on. Someone said, Can you cite having a postdoctoral there before coming to Nigeria as a post graduation plan? No, that's what I talked about. Do you understand what the question is, Dami? 
like saying that you want to continue uh, okay. postdoc. Like that's already an employment. You, <laughs> yeah. okay. you are already saying that you want to get employed there. Yeah, that mm -hmm. nullifies the reason why they should give you an F1 visa in the first place. So I think you want to avoid all that in your in your kind of answer. Whatever you do, you should try to tie it back to Nigeria. Back home. Yeah. Whatever you do. Um, even if you have the potential of getting the job after graduation, don't say you want to stay back and work in the US. It's going to nullify your um, the whole process. Mm -hmm. OK, so my mom is the one sponsoring me, but she sent the full funds to my account with a letter of sponsorship notarized, notarized by the high court. Would that be a problem? So. I think you should still go with your mom's bank statement and your bank statement. Because if you go with only your bank statement, and probably you were someone that didn't have money before, and then all of a sudden they seize these millions of dollars, mm -hmm. that, that's a red flag. So yes, go with your mom's bank statement. Also go with your bank statement. It will show that it's even show when she transferred the money to you, and it's even showing how full willingness to sponsor you. That's even a good thing for you because it shows that she's so willing to sponsor you that she's even transferred the money to you. So please go with the two bank statement. Only your bank statement showing that huge amount of money deposited at, at once is a red flag. And that's a mistake a lot of people do. They take somebody's money and transfer into the account just before they go for the interview. I know some people even do that, but they do it ahead of time, so it shows. But don't just go, you were having 5,000 naira in your account for <laughs> one year, and then a month you enter, you have 15 million. Please make sure you don't do that. So for this question, go with the two statements. My school resumption date is 22nd of August, 2022. Please, is it okay to go for interview next month, May 18, or wait? Before I think you are fine. So far, it's within 120 days. You should be fine. May to August is like 90 days. We are fine. I saw something regarding high school diploma on the document checklist listed here. I didn't feel anything regarding high school diploma in my DS-160 form. If you're going for the graduate degree, you need your high school document, right? Exactly, exactly. So if you're, so if you're a graduate student, I don't think you, yeah, you, don't you don't really know. care about that. But it's majorly for the undergrads. Yes. Okay, if I'm asked, do I have anyone in the US and undergraduate? If you have your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, you have to say it, mm -hmm. right? But if you have a distant relative, I don't think it's necessary, unless that distant relative is the one that is sponsoring you or have a connection to, or tell me what you think. That's, that's what I think. Yeah, and you must be careful too in that sense. If you put the distant relative, for instance, on your DS-160, you can't say you don't have distant relative when yes. you are going for the when they ask you the question. So for me, I would just try to avoid distant relative on my DS160. I'm not talking about it. I only talk about the close relative that I have. My parents, my brother, my sister, you know, those are the people that I'm going to focus on. I won't focus on any distant relative. Yeah, yeah please. So what I think we are, it's it's time up. Do we it, our time is up for this webinar? To um are you do we? What do we do? <laughs> we have lots of questions, and we I, I think I think we can wrap up the questions. We we don't have so much more. Um, yeah, maybe we can just speed up a little and and answer yeah. most of the questions. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, if you apply to more than fifteen schools, can you state them all when asked? You can not start listing fifteen schools. Just say, say just say I applied to fifteen schools. I got admitted by maybe 15 of them or 10 of them, and I'm, I'm, I, I decide to go to this particular one. Just give that statistics. You don't need to start calling out the names of the schools. And also, I just finished medical school in February and got a job immediately. I have not done my NYC. Would that be a problem? Not at all. Is there much no. to do? Mm -hmm. If I knew what I knew then, <laughs> that was a waste of, <laughs> waste of two years. <laughs> Anyways. I have a sister in, in, in the school I was admitted to. Is it wise to include it in my DS-160? I think it's not a problem. I have, or uh, do you think it's a problem, Dami? No, you, you have to include it because it's possible that your sister has already included you exactly. on her own DS-160. And then you are saying that you don't have any sister yeah. you know, in yeah. the US. So it's always good to just be truthful. Put it there and give them, if they ask any question around that, you give them the reason why you are. The same school. We have folks that are in the same school 
with their relatives. Currently, the... in my city here, yeah, one of the schools, I have this Nigerian friend, four siblings in the same mm -hmm. school. Yeah, so it doesn't to that for four of them. I and two have graduated, two are currently in that school. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. It's just that your parents want you guys to study in the US and they have the money to pay for it, and which is not mm -hmm. a problem. If um if I am asked why did I choose course, please you know why you choose your course. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> is my passport considered okay. We've talked about passport issues, so. Thank you very much for this wonderful program. You're welcome. I applied to 30 schools, wow, and got admissions to six. I got six admissions, two funded offer and 24 rejections. Is it advisable to say I applied to 10? <laughs> that was a lot of schools, <laughs> but it's good you applied it. it. It gave you more chances. Will it not appear as desperation? Can I mention I applied to 10 schools? Please, we do not encourage you to lie. Don't lie, please. Like, please make sure you apply to 30 schools. It does not show desperation. It actually can show determination. You are actually willing, to, you really want to get this degree. So you are willing to put the extra work. It's not easy to apply to 30 schools. What? <laughs> That's a lot of work. Please don't lie. Yeah. Don't lie. I'm working in a financial institution, but I studied industrial chemistry and I have planned to study MSc in material science and engineering. Can I be denied because my current job is not the same with my intended course? Now, I think for this particular question, you have to have a reasonable reason as to why you want to switch fields. It doesn't mean that they expect you to go one path to your graduate. Have a reason why, okay, you went working in the bank before, but now you want to go and do material science. Please have a, or Dami, you have a different answer. Yeah, uh, you have you have actually said it absolutely. Like you need to show a convincing reason why. I know Nigerian uh, system, you know, allows that because it's very difficult to even get a job as a chemist. You know, yeah. the banks are the ones hiring a lot of folks these days. So, uh, if you if you are fully funded uh, uh, scholarship, it won't really be a lot of issue. But you still need to have a convincing reason why you uh, why you are actually going for. Uh, a program in material science, you know, you should be, you should have a convincing reason on ground. Okay. Um, so moving on, um, I applied to only one school. Is it okay to say I applied to one school? If the view, uh, please, yes, you applied to one school, say you applied to one school and give the reason why you applied to only one school. Concerning social media, is it compulsory to include all your social media handles? No. <laughs> is it? I, I don't really know, but I think you just put the major one, Facebook, Instagram, and I mean, LinkedIn, that, that's just it. Yeah, you can't yeah. keep listing. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, I think those yeah, are the major ones. Also, please do, do not implicate yourself. If you know you're a type that posts a lot of things that can implicate you on Twitter, please do not implicate yourself by adding your Twitter handle. Um, yeah. You should put the... the mostly professional um, LinkedIn, if you have one, if you don't have it, you can put Facebook, if it's just your family members, you just post random stuff. But I know Twitter is a wild place. Um, yeah. So if you have engaged in some tweets that can, maybe it's related to US or not, please just don't include your Twitter handle. You should even take it off. Like you, sh you should even be posting that kind of a thing these days because of uh, no, 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 you might have posted like so many years ago and you didn't know. So um, if they really want to check, they can, especially mm. the, 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 the stage we are in right now in the world. So um, yeah, those things are very important. So okay. that's my fault. Uh, okay, the next question says, I haven't gotten any official admission letter, but I received research assistantship award. Am I cool? No, you are not cool. You need admission letter to go to the school. <laughs> Please yeah, get that. You should request that before you go to the embassy. You request for the admission letter. Yes, okay. I graduated in 2010, December, and the result was ready by June, July. Mobil and mobilized for NYC in November 2011, though I was teaching. So should I include that in my DS160? Include that we, we talked about the gap, right? Maybe just yeah, find find a, a way to craft it, you know, professionally. What were you doing and make sure that you don't have any gap. Okay, someone said I didn't we didn't answer their question. Please repeat the question because um I might have skipped them. I'm sorry about that. And we have less than five minutes to five be minutes. in. Okay, is it advisable to wait for Lagos date for 2020 resumption? What is 2020 resumption? Lagos date for 2020 resumption. Is it 20? I don't know what that means. So, hello, I, I asked the question concerning my NYC being added. We've talked about gaps. 
I don't have a job for over a year now. However, I'm a volunteer with an organization that's not related at all to my field. How do I feel that employment part of my DS-160? Being a part of an organization is actually an advantage to you. So I don't think it's a yeah. problem doing that. They actually want you to be part of it. it shows you you do community service, which is a good mm-hmm. thing. Yes. We also, with full funding, can I go to the embassy with my family for their F2 interview? Why not? Even without full yeah. funding. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, as long as you, are, you got admission here in the, as a student, you have the right to do F2. I have 64% funding. Mm-hmm. My cost of attendance is $31,000. My deficit is $11,000. I've provided support for my cousin. I'm an assistant lecturer in one Nigerian university and my salary is low. Please, can I say my deficit will be covered by myself and my cousin or just my cousin only? Please give me your best advice. Maybe we giving our worst advice before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's very clear. Like, you need to find a convincing reason why your cousin is the one sponsoring you. It has to be clear. You know, is it that your cousin doesn't, you know, know what to do with money and then he's just pouring it on you for the, you know, for your schooling? So you need to find a convincing reason why your cousin is the one funding you at this yeah. time. So. To add to that, to add to that, I know the other concern would be that they will say you're already a lecturer, so why can't you fund yourself? As you said, you're, but why is a lecturer salary thirty seven thousand naira? In- that's, that's that's Nigeria for you. I won't I won't be surprised. No. Okay, that's not the topic for today. Anyways, at least go also with your own documents that shows them mm-hmm. that you don't even have the money, even though you are working to fund yourself. So because of that, your cousin is willing to add to your education and also give a reason why that cousin is feeling so yes add yourself you can add yourself i think in this case you should add yourself and your mm-hmm. cousin because you have a job and they expect yeah. you to work yeah so is it advisable to mention you you have a relative in the we've talked about this please i applied to my school as a single but i got married last week happy <laughs> happy married life <laughs> should i feel the form as single or married if you're married so you have to feel as married Unless you're already as single before, but if you are yet to feel it, please is as married. Uh, please, you are married. Please do it. It can it can cause a lot of complication at some point because say, well, how did you do it? You know, so you should be feeling the right information at this time. Continue. He said, although I am not applying with my husband, he plans applying for four months after my travel. It's not a problem. Apply that you're married. But the good thing about, let me tell this person, the good thing is actually if you apply that you're married, it can actually show strong tie to your country. Okay, your husband is in Nigeria. So anyhow, anyhow, you want to come back and meet your husband. And that can even be an advantage to you. So please feel in as married. Concerning who is sponsoring my trip, can I put my mom? Although I was... I awarded a full ride scholarship. Yeah, your mom is paying for your flight. That's okay. Um, how many? Okay, guys, I think we've answered a lot of questions and we've touched different aspects of these questions. And we really hope this um, webinar will be helpful to you guys. And I'll give um, Dami and Ayo a minute or two to say something and we'll wrap up this webinar. Dami. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much, Jane. Thank you, everyone, for joining this session. I must say that, you know, it's a joy that you are able to join the session today, and we are wishing you the best in your uh, respective uh, visa interview. As we've said, uh, make sure that you are feeling the right set of information. Take the valid documents to the embassy. Make sure that you practice well enough. You know, there's no limit to practicing. Practice, practice, and practice. Do mock interviews. You know, uh, Practice your responses and uh, try to be uh, be flexible when you go to the embassy. Don't be mechanical. Like don't cram and then pour down uh, answers to the to the view. It doesn't work that way. Just make sure that you are maintaining that conversation. Let it flow from you. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, looking forward to hearing your success uh, story after the uh, visa approval. Thank you, Damien. Aya, do you have something to say before we wrap up? Um, so not really, just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to attend uh, this info session. If your question was not answered, please send them to info at answerofficial.org, info at answerofficial.org, or just go to answerofficial.com uh, website. You see all the information you need. Um, send those questions there. I will try as much as possible to answer them. 
Um, if you want to connect with anybody, just just type the names you see on the screen on LinkedIn. You should some of us should pop up. And you can reach out to uh, if you have direct questions you want answers mm -hmm. for. Thank you, guys, and have a good one. Yeah, and also, guys, please remember that you can become a member of ANSA. Just go to the website and register. Now that you're yet to get admission, you can become a potential um, a conditional member. And when you come into the US, please, we would like you all to become members of ANSA. This organization is very good because when you're here in the US, <clears throat> you need the community, you need a Nigerian community. And ANSA is a very good avenue for that. So please, when you finally get your visa approved and you come into the US, please make sure you're registered as a member of ANSA so we can all stay together and go through this studying in the US life together. We wish you all the very best in your interviews and we hope you guys will get approvals and we will have you all in the US in a couple of months time. All right, thank you guys for attending the webinar. And if you also need, we, we usually do, um, Webinars like this, it's not just about visa, it can be about um, when you're already in the US orientation and stuff. So make sure to follow us on our social media platforms so that you get updated when we have um, events coming on. It's Association of Nigerian Scholars, search in um, Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, YouTube, you'll see us there. Please follow us and stay updated. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, yeah.